Good evening. You are our honored guests, and we welcome you to this very special evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining this season-long project of Pacifica Christian High School and that we've entitled A Call to Conscience. We are very fortunate and, and, and very excited and honored to spread a message of, of historical accuracy and peace and goodness through the world, as Anne Frank sought to do through her diary and as she hoped to do after the war. We have a very special guest. It's my great privilege to introduce Solange Pullman Fish. Solange was a hidden child in France during World War II. We'll be hearing her story and she'll be taking questions um, and is delighted to be here. And our next guest is our educational consultant for throughout this season and, and for the, the diary of Anne Frank. And her name is Leslie White. Leslie is a Jewish and Hebrew studies teacher at Tarbut School. She's also affiliated with the LA Museum of the Holocaust and the Museum of Tolerance. And her help in this project has been invaluable. Leslie will be assisting Solange, giving us a little background information. She'll also be glad to take any questions that you may have. And finally, I think most of us know our beloved Reverend Butler. Reverend Butler will be conducting uh, the Q&A after these presentations, and he will now lead us in an invocation. Thank you very much. Please pray with me. You are blessed, O Lord our God, worthy to be praised forever and ever. For in calling forth creation by your word, you have made all things good and beautiful in their place and season, and have set over all that you have made the most excellent law of your peace, by which you, with perfect justice, govern all things. Have mercy upon us, O God, who call upon you from the depths of this broken world. For among us, transgressions have multiplied beyond number. But you, O Lord, hear the calling of your people in due season, and abound in steadfast love. Fly with haste to our rescue. Deliver us now, O God, from all things hurtful to us, and raise up among us true righteousness. For you are faithful to hear from heaven the earnest prayers of the people, you have made for yourself. Bless this gathering, therefore, O God, and all who partake of it with honest hearts and ready minds, and dawn upon us with the brightness of your countenance, that in your light we may see light, that in your straight path we may not stumble, and that, thus enlightened, we might go out to set forth your peace in the world, until you stand yourself to vindicate all your faithful ones upon the earth. Amen. We, um, you may notice our, our empty seat. Uh, we have invited and are expecting another guest who has not arrived, uh, Mr. Jack Pariser, who is a Holocaust survivor from Poland. So in hopes that he does arrive, we're saving his seat for him. <laughs> and please forgive me for not introducing myself. I'm Angela Ward, Director of Arts. So let's begin our program. Leslie? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say how grateful I am to Angela for having me as part of this production. Um, I'm Leslie White. I'm the education consultant, I guess, for this show, um, but I also teach Holocaust studies at Tarbut Latora. And last year at our Holocaust Memorial Assembly, Solange Fish came and spoke to our student body, and we were all so touched by her story. Um, I just want to share one figure with you. Um, as you saw outside the Butterfly Project, there were 1.5 million children murdered in the Holocaust. So those non-Jews who risked their lives to help Jews um, during this very dark time um, helped my friend Solange. So without further ado, I give you Solange Fish. Do I need this? Oh, what happened? Yeah. Well, With that, that's like for the camera. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hi, so my name is Solange Pullman Fish, and I thank you all of you for inviting me to speak to you. Uh, I know that all of you know about the Holocaust, the concentration camps, but I would like to tell you about my story and to tell you about the very courageous people who saved me. They are called the Vigorous Gentiles. It starts when the German invaded France. I was about five years old, and like millions of others, my life was being threatened simply because of the Jewish faith. Up to the year 2010, my family and friends knew very little about my experiences during the war. I kept my thoughts to myself. I did not feel that I was entitled to speak. My story was not that interesting to others. After all, I did not suffer physically at the hands of the Nazis. I had escaped the concentration camps. I was only what is called a hidden child. I knew that I didn't have a normal childhood and was left with emotional scars, but that's it. That's all. So I kept silent, but always remembering that era and the people who kept me alive. <clears throat> In 2010, I was living in Connecticut, and friends of mine started a campaign against France. And all French people, all French people were anti-Semitic, they said. And we had to boycott all their products. Whatever was imported here, we could not buy. It was really a campaign that I didn't understand. And it hurt me. I had been saved by hundreds of French citizens. And I talked a little about my experiences to them, but to no avail. So one day, I decided to write about what I remembered and felt in my heart. And when I was finished writing, I knew that I would share it with anyone willing to listen. And this is what I wrote. I first recollect the sirens blaring, and I'm running with my mother to the shelter, underground, because bombs are about to fall. We all have gas masks on our faces, and as a five-year-old, I really don't quite understand why we are in that shelter. What are bombs? But I was terrified, and every time we went to the shelter, it became more and more scary the noise of the sirens, the bombs, but also to look at the people with these ugly gas masks on. That was terrifying. Next, we were living in a town called Nancy. And I remember a very large square where barracks had been erected and where we were living along many other Jewish families. And what I know now was a makeshift ghetto. I don't remember much about those days. I can't even remember the inside of our place. But I remember about my mother sewing the yellow stars of David on the sleeves of our clothing. I also have a vision of two trucks coming into the square and men being led into this open, trucks, crying, women are crying around me. I did not know what it was all about. Only later did I find out that they were probably on the way to a concentration camp in death. In my own family, all my uncles, cousins, all my, the men family died. None of them survived. At some point, we were no longer in Nancy. But I remember moving from town to town across France, from the east to the south, trying to escape the Germans. And it's quite amazing to me now that we were always one step ahead of them because there was always a brave person who would warn my mother that we were in danger and we needed to leave. 
I have no recollection on how we traveled or how many different places we were stayed at, except that one time when my mother and I were in a rowboat, there was also a very young boy in that rowboat by himself. It was dark, a man is rowing, my mother's hand is on my mouth so that I don't speak, make noise because on the banks of the river, there were sentinels watching, ready to catch one of us, but we made it through. I often think of this young boy, hoping that somebody took care of him and that he kept alive. At some point, we were in the south of France, on the border of Spain in a town called Po, and we lived with a family who sheltered us and fed us. I don't know why, but I remember those days with a very warm feeling. I don't think it was lasting, it was going to last too long. And again, we were in danger and we had to leave. But this family gave my mother the name of a mayor who lived in a little village called Le Grand Bourg. It was a farming village with about 400 inhabitants, and that's where we spent the rest of our, the war. We actually lived in a presbyter. That's where the priest lived, in his own quarters. And my mother and I lived about the stables, in a one room with a small window, <coughs> one bed, a sink with only cold water, also a coal pot belly, a pot belly stove to keep us warm and where my mother would cook our meals. There were no bathrooms available. That was across the yard. And when, the, when it was warm, we bathed in the river with the soap that my mother made. Everyone else did the same thing. We also washed our clothes in the river. The presbyter also had a little farm with chickens and rabbits and horses and cows and a vegetable garden. And I remember milking the cows and getting the eggs from the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I could not go to school. I was with my mother at all times. Since the German soldiers would come in to the village and go to the farms to get food supplies. And they would stay around for a while. And always my mother was told that they were on their way here so that we would go and hide in the mayor's attic. And sometimes I would also hear them talk downstairs. And my mother would hold on to me, warn me not to make any noise. Again, I had no idea of what was happening. I could sense the panic in her face and in her words. And I was terribly scared. And I wanted to cry, but I was not allowed. When I think about it, my mother must have been terrified that any moment could have been the end of our freedom. But nothing happened. We were safe. When the Germans were not in the village, life was quiet and very lonely. We would go to different farms where my mother would barter for the food we needed. And in exchange, she would make fresh pasta for the farmers and also baked cakes and knitted garments. She also planted seeds in the priest's gardens to grow some vegetables. Never went hungry. I had everything to eat on my plate and I had to eat everything because my mother says other children are starving. <laughs> what I remember the most was the isolation, the loneliness, no one to talk to, no children to play with. My mother did not talk to me. She was always nervous, irritable, crying, and not telling me why did I do something wrong. As a child, I didn't understand. I felt so different from others. Why couldn't I go to school? Why couldn't I speak to anyone? At the farms, I watched children playing and laughing together. And why couldn't I join them? I would see people gathering by the church. 
with their children, all dressed up, having a good time, and I could not be with them. It was as if it was an inv invisible wall between us. There were no movie theaters. I did not have toys to play with, no radio to listen to, and no explanation why I was so different. What was wrong with me, I kept saying, although I didn't understand, really. Did I do something bad? But there was never any answer. The priest was a very good man. Sometimes he would sit with me and try to teach me how to read. But I didn't have any books to read otherwise. And I did not learn to write either. So between five and 10, that was the extent of my education. I remember a cobbler who made wooden shoes for me. There were no leather shoes. There were no paved roads, no cars, only horses, cows, and a lot of manure. <laughs> I remember a wedding taking place, people dancing with music from a radio and having a good time. And again, I was separated by that invisible glass, not part of the facilities. I was in a different world, just watching. And again, why? What was wrong? No answer. I was a hidden child, but yet everybody saw me. I was hidden in plain sight. All 400 visit, uh, villages with babies, young children and teenagers, all of the Catholic faith in a very tightly community had to know that we were there because we were Jewish. That's why we were there in their village, hiding from the Nazis with the help of the mayor and the priest. Nevertheless, they all decided to protect us at what could have been a horrible price, their own death. They knew that if one of them had told the Germans about us, chances are the whole entire village would have been destroyed. But in all that time, no one spoke. Words like racism, anti-Semitism, bigotry, that was not part of their vocabulary. We were strangers, but they knew that we were the innocent victims of a very cruel, inhuman regime. These villages that we call the righteous Gentiles were, human, were humble people, probably no high education, just hardworking, but they were compassionate, they had a conscience. Mostly, these righteous Gentiles were so courageous, and they are forever my heroes. So eventually we heard the church bell ringing and so all the farmers running towards the square and we were told that the war had ended. But not before six million Jews had been exterminated and millions more of all nationalities had also perished. Soon after we said our goodbyes and we left for a town called Metz in the northeast where my mother had some family. I was 10 years old then terrified of what looked like a big city with cars. I actually had never seen a car before. And what I was told were American soldiers in uniform walking in the street. Didn't I have to run from them before? Shouldn't I be running and hiding? Nothing made sense. For the first time I went to school and sat with other 10 year olds. I was completely bewildered. I did not have the skills for studying. I was 10 years old for my first day of school, not five, and what other children had learned in those early years was foreign to me. Yet, I was expected to adapt right away. My teacher either did not understand or maybe did not care, and she just implied that I was just lazy. Special programs for me did not exist then. 
I was on my own. My mother worked very hard to put food on the table. She did not understand my needs either. She didn't understand that I had needs that were not being met. I was aware that I had no one to turn to. Again, I was alone. No one to talk to, and a lot of times I became a truant. I walked the streets passing the time because school was so difficult for me. I felt like a fish out of water, did not belong anywhere. I also went to Hebrew school for the first time and to synagogue, and it was also very uncomfortable. I felt alienated from everyone else. No one to talk to, no one interested in my problems. And my mother, who was so used to having me for herself, didn't really allow me to make any friends. The war had left a mark on her, and she did not make friends either. She remained angry, nervous, fought with everyone, including her family. My mother had survived the Holocaust, but for the rest of her life, she never really found enjoyment and peace. So that was my new life, full of adjustment and trying to cope and understand. I finally learned that I was Jewish and what it meant, but I was still different. My only, employ my only enjoyment was to go to the movies with my mother and to watch American film and fantasizing about life in the good USA. Mm -hmm. I had two uncles and an aunt in Brooklyn, New York. And when I was 17 years old, they made it possible for my mother and I to join them. At that point, I did not look back. I was excited. Everything was going to be perfect. I was going to speak only English forget friends, and marry an American, and that's exactly what I did. <laughs> <laughs> By the mid-90s, I was able to go back to France. I needed to go and see Le Grandbourg, the village that really I never forgot, and that holds a very special place in my heart. My sister-in-law traveled with me. I had emailed the mayor at that time of my visit, and she welcomed us with open arms, along with the present priest, reporters, and two women, older women, who remembered me when I would go to the farms with my mother. We spent a wonderful day with them. We went everywhere, including a few miles away to a chateau, where we were told the story of about, about 60 Jewish children who had found shelter there until some safe place could have been found for them. As adults, they came back as a group together to the chateau and commemorated that event by uh, putting a large plaque on the wall, thanking the, that village for saving them. But Le Grand Bou was no longer what I remember. Some 50 years later, there were more manure, there were no more manure, <laughs> no more farms, Cars had replaced horses and cows. And aside from these two elderly women who greeted me, there was no one left from that era. It had become a retirement village. As a parting gift, I received the picture of the church, and it has been hanging in my bedroom ever since. I constantly think and honor all those righteous Gentiles who made it possible for me to grow older have two sons, three beautiful granddaughters, and to live my life as a senior in a very safe place. That my mother and I escaped concentration camps and death was not because of a miracle. It was because of the decency, the courage, the responsibility that these righteous Gentiles felt for others. My mother and I were not one of them, but they knew we were fighting for our survival. So each one of them, from the persons who would warn my mother in all these different towns, to the person rowing us to safety, to the family in Pau, the villagers in Le Grandbourg, 
and probably many others that I don't know about who crossed that path, all knew that the Germans wanted to exterminate us. But all they saw was a very frightened mother and young child who were fighting to stay alive. We needed them and they came to us and they rescued us. Thousands and thousands of Jews were also fortunate to escape because of many other righteous Gentiles who were willing to risk their lives to save another. I myself have three female cousins who were saved that way. For me to honor them, to honor their memories, is not only just to talk about them and to tell you that this is their story as well as mine. Their story of unbelievable strength, courage, and to try to live the life they gave me the way they lived theirs, with the same principles. That all of us have the basic right to be judged individually for ourselves and for our actions, and not just because we are a different race, practice a different religion, or live a different lifestyle. Thank you for being here and listening. I'd like to say something else. Um, there has been a rash of anti-Semitism in the last few months, especially in schools in Orange County. And I really want to thank Angela Ward, Kathy Millett, for caring enough to do this today. I think it takes courage and it takes fortitude. And when I look around, I have hope that other people like you will stand up and do the right thing. Thank you. No, she never adjusted to life, period. She died very unhappily at the age of 95 without any friends and just very unhappy, always. Get out of which part? When, when, at the beginning of the war, when, when you recall that your mother was, was uh, sewing the stars on your clothes and all the things were together in the area, I, how, how did you well, that? I remember being in that ghetto. I have no idea how we were able to leave. Um, 
it's a mystery to me how we went from town to town from from the northeast to the south. I don't know. I have absolutely, you know, I was a young child. Um, I can't remember that part. My mother never spoke to me, <laughs> no. So we never talked about it. Um, and at first, you know, it was my life. I didn't know, I knew that I was different, but I had no idea that I was so different that I just, I don't know. It's, uh, it's hard to explain. Um, you live a life and it's your life. And um, it's not until later that you really understand what happens. And I was really in my mid, maybe 20s or 30s when I started to put this whole thing together and even understand how lucky I was that I had been saved, that, that uh, there were people who really cared so much about other people, that they were willing to put their lives uh, in danger from us. At the beginning, I just didn't, even after the war, I was just trying to grow up or trying to just live the life that, that I had that was given to me. Uh, it's not until later that I really start to put things together. And I know there's a lot of things. Maybe it's a defense mechanism in me that I've forgotten a lot. I don't remember all. Like, I don't know how we went from town to town except for that one robot incident that I remember. I don't remember otherwise if I went with a car, uh, I don't think so. I don't remember a bus, I don't remember a train, I don't remember anything except certain, I don't even remember uh, the people, you know. I know that they were there but I can't picture their faces. It's. Um, Hard. You expressed so beautifully the bewilderment that you had as a child, which is obviously understandable. How, and I'm sure it took you many decades, and even now, there's probably a lot emotionally that's very difficult to process or understand having missed so much and having not really had those, those questions answered over many decades mm -hmm. of your life. But how, how would you say that this experience impacted you in terms of being a mother yourself? And, and how did, did you, do you think you raised your children with that constantly sort of subconsciously in, in the back of your mind? And, and how, did, how do you see it impacting the last four years? years of your life, those, those early years? Uh, I never got over the fact that I'm different. No matter how hard I try, I'm different than my friends. Uh, when I was bringing up my children, it was also a hard time because I was a divorced mother and I was by myself. And, uh, but I always, I always knew that I wanted my children to understand that not everybody's like them, that there are different races, and that we have to accept people for who they are. Uh, that was very important for me, uh, to be tolerant of others to judge everybody individually. Um, I, I hope that that's the way 
I want to bring them up. It's the way I think they are. And um, I try myself to kind of blend in with the rest. And sometimes I succeed, and sometimes I don't. Uh, I've gone for help, but it's, I think what happens to you as a child more or less stays with you. You accept the fact that you are who you are. Uh, for me, I just try to be a good human being. As I say, these people live inside of me, they really do. And they are my conscience. And um, I'm sure that I fail once in a while. It's hard sometimes to be objective, uh, but uh, that's the way I want my children to be, my grandchildren to be. I choose my friends that way also. It's important for me. I want to be able to respect the way they think, uh, just as I want them to respect me. And um, that's how I do it. <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm sure I speak for everyone in the room that hearing you and meeting you, you will live inside each of us. Oh, thank you. So don't ever feel completely alone. I know that I'm not alone. I have well, great friends, <laughs> but sometimes it just, and we're new I feel different. you touched all of us. Very thank you. Easy. Even though I lived with a priest, he never really asked me to go to church, never talked to me about God. I had no idea there was a God. Uh, as I say, I didn't know anything about religion until after the war. And uh, for some reason, I, I'm a secular Jew. Um, I, it's hard for me to say it, but uh, I have a problem with God, if there is one. And, um, I live my life, I think the people who are inside of me, these righteous Gentiles, if there is anything, they're my God. That's who I answer to. And it's, uh, I've tried to understand why I feel this way. I've spoken to my boys, but uh, I don't feel comfortable going to a place of worship. And I'm very Jewish, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a religious person.
Uh, unfortunately, uh, I only have one cousin left. Most of them were older than me. The, the other two, my first cousins, uh, died over the years. Uh, so there is only one that's alive. And she lives in New York, in France. And uh, we keep in touch, but not very often. We came back to Metz, and um, they lived in a town called Sedan. And somehow, my mother must have gotten in touch with her sister. Uh, as I said, it didn't last very long. My mother fought with everybody. So I really didn't see them that often. And. Uh, I really grew up without a family, even <coughs> after the war. So I didn't get to really know them that well. What did you say? How you mentioned that yeah, Orange County yeah. is anti-Semitism, so how can they be better you know, neighbors to like, the Jewish community, yeah. or how, what can they do? Well, you, you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're all here for, this, for one reason, because you didn't like probably what was happening. You read the papers, you listened to the TV, you know what was going on. And you're doing what you have to do by putting by the uh, the school putting on this marvelous play. You attending. Um, maybe you can reach one other person. Talk to them if they don't feel the way that you do. Maybe you could change the conversation. Uh, That's about all that you can do. But you're here for us. We're here for each other, and that's what counts. And people like you are very important, and it's appreciated very much. So thank you for all being here, being part of this. It's wonderful. It's reassuring to me that there is hope. Thank you.